Peter Maynard leads U.S. Information Solutions Data and Analytics team to identify and drive innovative data and analytics solutions for Equifax, one of the national credit reporting companies. His teams have generated six patent-pending technologies. Meet the leaders shaping the new era of credit. This is the Vantage Core Podcast. Today, we talk to Peter Maynard, Senior Vice President of USIS Data and Analytics at Equifax. Part one. I grew up in Rhode Island. I have a sister who's about 18 months younger than me, Jennifer, and then my father's a college professor was a college professor, and then my mother was a guidance counselor at a local middle school. And so loved Rhode Island. I was what was called a free-range kid back in the day. So literally, my parents would ask me to go, you know, go have fun with my friends. I'd go out for the day and then, you know, show up at nine o'clock at night sort of thing. And really enjoyed Rhode Island. It's, been, it's a big part of who I am. It's, it's a very unique state and Rhode Islanders are, are really proud. For me, it was very formative in terms of kind of how I looked at the world and the extended family I grew up with. In high school, we had a personal finance class that you could test out of. Right? You could take a test and you could test out of it. And I actually didn't. I, I really wanted to take the class. I thought it was an interesting topic. And you know, we played a stock market game where we had to like, we had certain commodities that we had and we had to trade those commodities and those sort of things. But I also got to understand credit there, the introduction to you know, banking and credit products. I got some introduction there. And then when I was in college, I didn't know what major I wanted. I, I was a physics major, then I was a math major. I was like, oh, this is kind of too theoretical for me. And I was very, I'm a very practical person. And so I loved, you know, at the time, uh, political science. And, you know, my father's like, well, do you want to be a political science professor or kind of what, what do you want from a career path? And I was like, well, no, not really. And so I ended up taking economics at University of Rhode Island. And that's when I really fell in love with it. And incidentally, my father, who's, he's a psychologist by training, he, he was actually had an instrument that I took when I was in college, which was what sort of career path should I go on? And I remember taking, it was like, it was like a six hour exam or something, you know, I like, I had to, like, I had to do the strength of my hands. I had to do, you know, calculate math questions quickly. I had to read things, I had to write things. And uh, I came out banker at the end of the day. And we kind of joke about that because I ended up working for a bank in the 1990s. And so, you know, I said to him, well, dad, your validity of your instrument is, is hundred percent, right? So obviously one data point, but we do laugh about that, that it's, you know, in college, I was destined to become a banker. I worked at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. So I had uh, just graduated my master's and PhD from University of Tennessee in, in economics. I focused on uh, environmental economics and econometrics. And at VCU, I worked at their Center for Public Policy. And it, it was an awesome first job because I had to work with state agencies and help them conduct what's called outcomes analysis, right? To look at the efficacy of the investments that they made to see what the return on those investments were. I also worked with local city governments. I also worked with nonprofit organizations. And this is in 1996. This is when there's a lot of effort, a lot of money from the Clinton administration and environmental justice, also in housing and cleaning up kind of the lead-based paint that was existing in the older housing stock. And so as an economist, I'd come in and say, hey, here's the economic benefit of investing in the cleaning of these homes in terms of at-risk children and saying, hey, you know, their IQs are going to be improved because you're cleaning it up, which allows them to get to higher education or graduate from high school and then get better jobs. And so here's the net economic impact. So it was an excellent training ground for applying yourself to work and solving things that matter. To this day, it's, it's been something that I've carried with me in terms of how to use analytics to help solve meaningful problems. After Virginia Commonwealth University, I went to a healthcare consulting company. And I did something that was super fancy name, uh, which was called pharmacoeconomic analysis, which is basically looking at cost benefit analysis towards medical interventions. And so looking at outcome data. So I ended up doing some work on the elderly and looking at adherence to medication, whether or not people would um, the impact on their quality of life and those sort of things. And so I was the staff economist who worked with these pharmacists to kind of look at the outcomes or the impact of working with Medicare, Medicaid, and then insurance uh, organizations, right? Like uh, an Anthem and, you know, or a Blue Cross Blue Shield in terms of how to help their patients. I loved the work, but I was the most senior 
analyst. And so for me personally, I was like, oh gosh, you know, I, I have so much more to learn in my discipline. And so at the time I lived in Richmond, Virginia. And if it was, if you're 1999 and you had a quantitative background and you lived in Richmond, Virginia, then you became acquainted with Capital One. And so I did the interview at Capital One. I loved the interview at Capital One. I loved just meeting the people and the sort of problems. And so I joined Capital One in 1999 as a statistician focused on our underserved or Capital One's underserved markets at the time. Within a year, I started, I, I was a tech, what's called a technical statistician. So I was bought in to work on kind of uh, experimental design work as well as model building. And, uh, and then I started to lead a team. A couple of years later, I was then asked to, to grow a team in terms of our operations. So I went from card acquisition to card customer management to card operations. And then from there, I went to our diversified financial or Capital One's diversified financial services organizations. So I worked in small business and I worked with Canada. I worked for small business loans and small business card, uh, personal loans, those sort of things. And so as I grew in the organization, I took on obviously more responsibility. So I not only became a statistician or leading statistical functions, but also led data analytics. We call it now data science or data wrangling. Or, so I had those sort of functions uh, as well. What I really enjoyed about Capital One is I got exposure to a lot of different businesses very quickly and, and a lot of different value chains. And so I worked in a lot of different types of data and always about, hey, how do you drive better decisions with analytics and data? In 2013, I ended up leaving Capital One and joining Equifax. It's interesting because, you know, Equifax, if you work at a you know, company like Capital One, you're exposed to Equifax immediately, or at least I was. So in 1999, I was using Equifax data to build models which was just an amazing experience because in graduate school, when you built models, it was like on a thousand observations and maybe 10 columns. And I came to Capital One and I'm like, well, here's an Equifax data set and here's, you know, 10 million observations. And then here's like a couple hundred columns, you know? And so it was just amazing just to see the, the breadth of, of data that Equifax had. That's when I, you know, I got exposed to Equifax and then obviously through the, the products Equifax had, you know, became more familiar with what Equifax could do to solve Capital One's, you know, problems in terms of growing our book or managing costs and those sort of things. And so I had developed a relationship with a guy named Rajiv Roy, who is head of technology at Equifax and also our identity and fraud uh, unit at the time. And so when I was looking for a change, he and I started talking about the opportunities at Equifax. And that's, that's kind of how I joined. And Kathy Doss was also somebody who was part of the uh, equation in there. So she was somebody I worked with and looked up to at Equifax who joined from Capital One as well. So kind of followed in her footsteps of going from Capital One to Equifax. So I lead the data and analytics team for our U.S. information solutions division. So it's our division that manages our core credit function. So if you think about uh, the credit file, the credit bureau, but my team is responsible for curating that data as well at, and managing the data, but also developing the insights and then the actions our, our customers can take off that data. So spend a lot of time working with the various, you know, my technology partners, my product partners and sales partners to, to help solve our customers' problems and help them grow, really. That's the biggest thing that I see these days, uh, especially post-COVID, like, you know, everyone's asking, like, hey, how can we grow and how can we help our consumers? And so that's a big part of uh, why I enjoy my job and what I do with USIS is driving that growth. It's a, a really unique history. In 1899, a pair of grocers had identified that their list about who paid their grocery bills was valuable to the residents of Chattanooga. So they were storekeepers and they kept the tally of, you know, back in the day of who paid off what they charged for at their grocery store. And they went to other retailers around the city of Chattanooga and they found that their, their list was valuable or more valuable than the goods that they sold. And so being entrepreneurs, they identified they had a business opportunity. They actually ended up uh, lifting shop and then moving to Atlanta. And it was you know, the retail credit company uh, in 1899. And so it grew as commerce grew in the United States as, as credit began to grow in the United States. And then uh, the 1960s is one of the largest credit bureaus in the nation. And then in 1979, it changed its name to Equifax. The point there on the name is that it's equitable, factual information is, is what Equifax means. Credit is what, if you think about one of the 
most important you know, over the last couple thousand years, one of the most important innovations is double entry bookkeeping. So debits and credits. And I'm not an accountant. For me, that that's what I learned in, in school is like the ability to actually garner credit, to grant credit is, is, a, is an ability to grow the company, the ability to grow a business, the ability to grow our country. And so credit is happening all around us all the time. You may have two businesses that if you think about, you know, I'm a trucking business and I need access to more trailers. The company that owns the trailers is going to lease me those trailers over a 60-day time period. And they'll grant credit. They'll say, hey, you know, I've worked with you in the past for 60 days. You don't have to pay now. You can pay later sort of thing. So it's a lubricant that's impacting everything that we do. And it's important for consumers because they need the ability to access the finances that they need for life decisions. Either you know, from a student wanting to go to, to school, to people buying their first car, to buying their house, and as I mentioned, businesses looking to get capital and grow, it's really a, a pivotal part of what makes this country expand. And, and you can see that, right? You can see in 2008, what was the biggest concern that people had is the lockup of the credit markets. That's where you know, people were beginning to lose faith in credit markets, and that's where the Federal Reserve stepped in and had the quantitative easing and the influx of capital and to make us grow. And you can even see that today, you know, the lowering of interest rates, the stimulus to keep us on track during COVID. And so credit is, is really the, the lifeblood of our, of our country. And it's important that people manage credit, right? Countries manage credit, businesses manage credit, and people manage credit, right? Because it's, it's something that needs to be attended to. It's really important. What I find really interesting about Equifax is that we've been on a really amazing technology journey. We're now cloud native. And so it actually is a transformation of how we can create value for our customers. It allows you know, the surfacing of data in more secure ways, allows surfacing of the data faster, uh, that people can access it using the best tools and technology. And so for us, it's been a huge in our ability to differentiate ourselves and provide the right set of solutions to our clients. The second thing is our unique data. So Equifax is known for having differentiated data assets, the things like the work number, which is the largest employment database in the U.S. And it has you know, real verified income that's updated every two weeks or every paycheck cycle. We also have utility data. We have data from mobile companies. We have data from utilities. We have data from cable companies. And those payments are not trivial in terms of how much people spend every month, right? You can see that being a father with children, I can see how much I spend on those things, right? And you know, it can get close to a car payment. And consumers should get credit for paying those things, right? And that's reflected in that data. The other thing that we have is the best toolkit in advanced predictive analytics. And so we were the first to develop a regulatory compliant neural network or AI and machine learning algorithm for credit that's completely transparent and has reason codes. So everyone can see what goes into the model to make sure it makes business sense and make sure it, it uh, is regulatory compliant. And so those analytics is really important as well, because what we want to do is we want to use the best science with the best data to, to create the best outcomes for businesses and consumers. And that's really a win-win. So when we've talked about that with regulators about what these methodologies do with the alternative data, it allows people to, to hear yes more often. So consumers are approved for products that historically they wouldn't have been approved for. I find that personally rewarding, exciting to see my team and others within Equifax kind of create those solutions. And then last, we have a data fabric. And so, you know, that for us is that sort of data ecosystem that allows us to have that immediate access to the data, that allows us to govern the data and purpose the data in the ways that maximize the contribution of the data for the different products. So before we were kind of in our silos, I think people have always heard about data silos. This is something that we've solved for by having the data fabric. So if there's a new data source out there that our work number team or our direct to consumer team comes up with that's valuable, we can access that data too very easily and seamlessly. 
depending on the use case so that we can purpose it for our products and services within USIS. So that's very exciting, that, that sort of data democratization that happens with the data fabric and un unleashing the data so it can be used by multiple end users. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Vantage Score Solutions. This podcast is brought to you by Vantage Score Solutions, a higher level of confidence. Thanks for listening.